Hello, everyone, and welcome to this BAFTA Masterclass with David Heyman. Um, for anyone who's not joined one of these events before and you would like closed captioning of the <coughs> whole event, there is a button at the bottom of your screen that you can click on and you will get closed captioning. Also at the bottom of the screen, there is a button entitled Q&A, and we'd like to have your questions throughout the whole of this event, so please do send in questions for David. We're going to talk for about 40 minutes or so, and then um, I'll, I'll bring in your questions. If we have a, a very relevant question to something we're talking about, then I'll also bring it up then. David Heyman is one of this country's most successful producers. Since the 1990s, he's built up a prestigious body of work from the Harry Potter and Fantastic Beasts series through to projects as diverse as I Am Legend, The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, Gravity, and many other films. In the last year alone, he produced two major award season contenders and also critically acclaimed and commercial hits with Quentin Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and Noah Baumbach's Marriage Story. Upcoming is uh, the next installment in the much-loved Paddington series and also uh, another episode in the Fantastic Beasts series. Uh, David, thanks for joining us today. It's good to be here. Thank you very much for hosting me. So um, I saw an interview with you on the red carpet at the London Film Festival premiere of Marriage Story and you were asked the question if you could give a piece of advice to a producer um, what would it be? And you said, follow your heart. I'm curious about the instinct of following your heart, of, of knowing that you have a project um, that will become a good film. Is this something that, that you've always sort of had, or is it something that you've had to develop? Well, I've always had an instinct. I think everybody has an instinct of what they like and uh, what they want to see, what they enjoy, what, what they care for. Um, what I think I have become more comfortable with is trusting that instinct. Um, and also, which is the role of a producer, is to marry what I love and what I care about with its viability. Um, you know, there are, th I have, you know, I've said this before, you know, I have my pretentious side and there are things I like that I know, uh, that I imagine very few people will like. And that doesn't mean that I shouldn't pursue them, but they should be pursued at a scale that allows them to, to exist and hopefully have, make their money back. Because, you know, making film and television, it's an expensive enterprise. Uh, when you're, whether you're spending 500,000 or 100 million, uh, it's, you know, it's an expensive uh, it's expensive, you know, think how many paintings or, or books or et cetera, et cetera, that could be created. Um, so there is a, there, I do believe that, that, that there is a responsibility when you're handling that much, but it's <clears throat> uh, money. But, but I've always known what I've liked. Um, um, but over time, I, you know, and, and the fact is, is that nobody knows what other people will like. Anybody who tells you they know what people want, don't trust them. Nobody knows. I think I have a sense of what people might not want to see, or a significant audience might not want to see. Uh, but what I do know is what I like and what I care for. And also, it's such a, it takes such a long time to get something made. And if I am working on something that is a job as opposed to a passion, I'm giving much less of myself. I'm not drawing on what's best in myself. And um, I don't think I am offering as much to the venture. So, you know, as I say, it can take, I'm working on a film right now. I'm, uh, I'm developing a film right now with Danny Boyle um, and, and, and Michael P. Jordan. I've been working on that project for 20 plus years and I still love it. There are some projects that you fall out of love with. That one I, I care for as much as I did when I first started. <clears throat> um, uh, it takes a long time. Um, so you have to have that passion in order to convey the passion and in order to get people to say yes. People. Who are, going to, who are going to commit to what you do have to believe that you want to pursue it and that you believe in it. So that instinct, that belief, that passion is central to making something happen. So taking that idea, um, 
I'm, I'm curious about the notion of, uh, um, one might call it a David Heyman film, not necessarily a brand, but um, I was lucky enough to attend an exhibitor screening of the first, uh, the first Paddington film a couple of years ago, and you turned up to introduce it. Um, and I know that every person in this room was stunned by your passion and the way that you spoke about the film for the five minutes before it began. Um, and it, it, it felt like it wasn't just, I'm the producer of this film, I've been working with this director. We could tell that this was something that was so close to your heart and something that you'd, you'd been so personally involved in over um, a period of time. So I'm curious about the way that you find your own form of expression, your sort of unique stamp as a producer, or do you, I guess the flip side is, do you see yourself that way or do you see yourself more as someone who has to facilitate um, other people? Um, I don't know that one can tell a David Heyman film. <clears throat> I think that would be, uh, I, I don't really aspire to that. Um, I think that I am someone whose taste is very eclectic. Uh, you, you sort of highlighted that, whether it be Harry Potter or Quentin Tarantino, Paddington and Noah Baumbach. Um, gravity you know those it, it 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 it's it doesn't all fit neatly into into a box and and my interests are eclectic i am drawn to 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 pieces about people and that there's a humanity and characters that that i can invest in and and and, and care about that is central um <clears throat> i feel that i want every film i have to have a thematic underpinning uh, a reason for being and also hopefully you know, the very best that it can be. Don't always succeed. Uh, I failed, we failed on, you know, many, many times, but, but asp aspiring uh, to be the very best that it can be. And being led by directors with a very distinct point of view. Uh, in, in, I, I believe that you can make a, you know, th that a director, dr film is a director's medium. Writers are a writer medium too, but, but it is the director who ultimately um, so much rests on. And um, you, of course you need a good script. Without a good script, you know, you're compromised from the beginning. But it's the director. If you have a, an ordinary director, you can never have a great film. Um, so one of my key roles as a producer um, is, to, is to support directors in realizing their vision. Now that doesn't mean always saying, agreeing with that director. Sometimes it's to challenge and question, but ultimately the director has final say. It's not David Heyman who has final say, it's the director, because otherwise I should be directing. It's the same with the script. I mean, I can make recommendations, but I'm not sitting at the keyboard writing. Um, so it's about, you know, I suppose one of the things that I've learned over time is where to invest my energy, where I'm best served, when to give up, <laughs> uh, which I find still find very hard to do, and how to get the points and ideas across so that a director and or writer uh, and any of the creative team are able to hear, understand, and believe in, in it. But again, I, 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 um, it's, the director's vision is key, and my you know, I see my role as supporting that vision. I just want to see how that support's developed over time. Um, I didn't realize when I first saw Juice, which is the first film that you produced in 1992, which I think is one of the more original of the Hood films made in, in that period. And then you're an exec on The Day Trippers. But then in 1996, you set up Heyday Films and the first production was Antonia Bird's Ravenous. Could you talk about your decision at that point in time in setting up Heyday Films and what you wanted to achieve thinking about that. <clears throat> I was living in, 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 in New York at the time and I was struggling, you know. Um, I'd, I'd spent several years in LA, first as an executive, then as a producer, uh, partnered for a while with uh, 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 someone who's a very successful producer, Neil Moritz, who has done the Fast and the Furious movies uh, amongst many others. And I, um, it was a very good partnership. Neil was very loyal, very straightforward, very communicative. And um, where I question everything, Neil questioned very little and it was a good balance <laughs> at the time. Um, but ultimately I didn't want to live in Los Angeles. And also I realized in some ways that I wanted to make different films to Neil. So I moved to New York and uh, tried to 
make a go of it, uh, but was struggling. So I decided to move back to London and I persuaded Warner Brothers to give me a first look deal. A first look deal, meaning they get a first look at everything that I come up with. Um, and if they don't want to pursue it, I can go elsewhere. Um, I thought at the time that I was going to, that, uh, how I sold them was on it was that I was going to be a bridge between both countries. I'd spent, I'd gone to university in America, I'd spent 16, 17 years in America, and, um, and yet I was British. So I spoke both languages, as it were, uh, because we do speak a different language. I mean, yes, English, but it's a different sort of English, and uh, Hollywood and, and, and the UK have different, had uh, and uh, different imperatives. And so I came back to London, determined to be this bridge, um, and thought that, uh, and I arrived and then I found that, there, that I wasn't the only person trying to do this, <laughs> that actually Miramax had an operation, which I think David Orkin was running, and someone called Jonathan Darby had come back with uh, Mike Metaboy, I think TriStar, and they were doing the same thing. And, and so I wasn't as different as I thought I was, um, wasn't quite as unique as I thought I was. Um, I do think, by the way, you know, I, I got a, uh, another, going, I'm jumping, going on a tangent here, yeah. but I was, uh, one of the best pieces of advice as a, for a producer, I think, is dare to be different. And that was presented to me by a man called Ned Tannen, who asked me what I wanted to do, who was head of, he was head of Universal at the time. He was responsible for the John Hughes pictures. And he asked, he, I was just starting off and I went, I got a meeting with him and he said, so, so, so uh, what do you want to ultimately do? I said, well, I think I want to be a producer. And he said, oh. he said, well, if I were you, I'd get a job in distribution. I said, why? He said, because nobody else wants to do that job and you might just get a job. Now, the point wasn't necessarily go and get a job in distribution, though a job in distribution actually is a very useful part of the, uh, of the whole, you know, of an understanding of the business. But what he was saying was dare to be different. Don't follow, don't be like everybody else. Dare to do your own thing. Um, so when I came back, um, one of the things I did do that was distinctive at the time was make books a central part of my business. Very few people were doing that in quite the way I was. Um, and and uh, the reasoning was partly it was different, but also because I was in the UK and communicating with people 6,000 miles away, an original idea of, was a harder thing to convince them of. If you had something that was concrete, a book, it was a much more, much easier sell in some way, a script or a book or something like that. Yeah, sure, a treatment maybe, but that was much harder. It's much, it felt much further away from a reality to those in California. That's changed, of course, now, but at the time that was very much the case. And I'm very lucky I did because, you know, uh, I came back in 1996 and, and in the middle of 1997, I, I, uh, this book came across my desk that again, I had no idea would become the success it was. And that was Harry Potter. I mean, I thought it would be a nice, small, modestly priced British independent, you know, small British film. Little, you know, that shows how ignorant I was. I didn't realize how much all this visual effects was going to cost or that the book was going to be the success that it was. I just liked it. It moved me. I thought it was funny. I love the themes of outsiders, which is something that does run through a lot of my work, the outsider, uh, because I think we all in some way feel like outsiders. We can be married. We can be in love. We can be part of a community. We can be part of a club, whatever it may be. We all at times feel alone. We all at times feel like outsiders. I think it's sort of the, the human condition. Um, so I was drawn to that. I'd also been to a school like Hogwarts, but without the magic. So I connected with it. But if someone had told me that it would change my life the way it had, I would, I mean, come on. Uh, so, yeah, again, it's trusting your instincts and finding something that, that had meaning for me and that I could relate to and bring something to the table. Let's talk about this, um, the point of involvement, because it's interesting. I did, um, having not had children, I didn't know anything about Harry Potter until <laughs> I think the third book. And uh, someone I was working with who was a mother just said, 
oh, this is growing, this is becoming huge now, uh, before, again, before the films came out. Um, what, what was the, the reception when you decided, actually, yeah, this is something we want to do, the first Harry Potter book, we, we want to turn this into a film, and how quickly did it grow from your original vision of perhaps being a small British film into what it eventually became? Um, so I read an unpublished manuscript, um, or maybe, and then, and, and, and then maybe the Gallic, no, I think it was an unpublished manuscript. <clears throat> to show how little I knew, I think I may have bought or been sent six or ten copies of first editions to send to writers uh, to adapt it. And um, I didn't keep any for myself because why would I, you know? Um, and of course, those are quite valuable now. Um, again, to highlight how little I know. Um, it, it, it took Warners a while to negotiate the deal. Um, it, it, the deal was closed just before the book came out in the States. Um, so I think that was the middle of 97, maybe early 98. It took a while. I was already trying to get writers involved prior to that and was passed on by a lot of them. In fact, everybody who I sent the, the, the book to, none of them said yes, uh, or the first edition to, none of them said yes. Um, I then sent it to Steve Clovis, who is a brilliant but notoriously slow writer. And by the way, so during that time, pictures came in with cheerleaders, um, pictures came in with, 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 with set, resetting it in America, um, so there were some quite strange uh, approaches, uh, all of which we said yes, uh, said no to. Um, and, but Steve said yes, and he's a brilliant writer who'd never written um, a family film before, but was brilliant at adaptation. He had done The Wonder Boys, um, the Michael Shaben book, which was a beautiful film. And he'd also written an adaptation of a book called Shockproof Sydney Skate, a screenplay that never happened, but had a teenager at, at the center of it. And uh, what I thought was, he, he was brilliant at, at capturing the spirit of the author. And for me, Joe's voice was so central to the book's success, the story, the characters, of course, but if there was a way to capture in some way Joe's voice, I think it would, it would, it would be, wonderful. Um, but so Steve began writing. I, I can't remember when he started writing, but all I know is the third book was published and was on the cover of Time magazine before he delivered the script. Backing up, um, just again to show you how little anybody knows, uh, Warner's around the time of the publishing of the first book uh, in America, um, or maybe the second book in America, had a meeting about books that had that were bestsellers or that had value. And Lionel Wigram, who was the executive at Warner Brothers, uh, a fellow Brit, um, brought up the fact that we had Harry Potter and that was a bestseller in the UK. And the head of the studio was utterly dismissive. You know, it's a bestseller in the UK. That doesn't mean anything. Um, jump forward to being on the cover of Time magazine and Steve Clovis going, oh my goodness, this little book that I had started work on has now become an international phenomenon. And, um, and you know, one, once his script came in, we went straight to his first draft. There was no rewrite before we went to directors and we were off and running uh, very, very quickly. So from, we, we, we ended up shooting in 2000 for release in 2001. So it's interesting to look at this, which is uh, could have been a very small British film with perhaps not so many effects. It became something bigger, but it still retains this this very very clear sense of identity. And jump forward um, a decade and a half from the first film to Paddington. I remember first hearing about that, thinking, "Really, Paddington? It, it's it's so British. It's so singular in in." its portrayal of a certain aspect of British life. And yet, once again, it's, it's finding the universal and the local. Um, is that something that you just feel now you've become so attuned to that, that you can see how something that people might think is not parochial, but perhaps 
smaller could speak to a larger audience? I'm, I am an internationalist. I, um, yes, I am an internationalist. And um, I have had, I've traveled, I've had the good fortune to travel. I've lived in America. I spent a year in India. Um, I've traveled for months and months at a time. And, you know, what you realize is as much as there is division, there is so much that unites us and brings it together. And that there are themes and ideas that, you know, notions of family, of outsideness, of, uh, that, 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 that cross borders, um, that are just the human condition. So Paddington um, was about embracing difference. The first film was about embracing difference. And, and I always look, as I think I said earlier on, for that, that essence, that reason for being, that, that, that what does it mean to me that might connect with others? Um, uh, so Paddington was about an outsider. Um, it was about how, about finding a home for Paddington and about for the Browns, and Mr. Brown in particular, it was about embracing difference. And in embracing difference, your life will be enriched. And, um, and so in the second film, it was about looking for the good in people. If you look for the good in people, they will find it in themselves, even if they didn't realize it before. And, you know, those are themes that aren't unique. I mean, they're, they're, not, they're not British themes. They're not American fields themes. They are themes about, of, of, of the universal themes. Gravity is about, you know, one of the central themes is, is about live in the moment. It's actually in a lot of Alfonso's, Quaron's films. Don't live in the past, don't live in the future, live now. And um, that's, you know, that's, uh, that's something that is universal. So uh, it is, it's, it, it's, it, it's intuitive, um, but it's also, yes, it's intuitive and it's in the, a belief that what, what I like and what has meaning, that I'm not that unique, that there is much more that, as I say, that's like that, that we're all connected. Um, I want to talk about your levels of involvement. Um, I've been lucky enough over the last 10 years, years or so um, to do a number of BAFTA events with production designer Stuart Craig, um, responsible, obviously, for Fantastic Beasts and, and Harry Potter, amongst so many other things. Um, and he, I think the second time we spoke, um, he mentioned a story involving you where I'm not sure which Harry Potter film it was, but um, you were present, I think it may have been watching Rushes, and you realized that the spell that had been cast by one of the characters was not the spell that we actually saw on the screen. And he was hugely impressed with the level of knowledge that you had of all of the books that you were able to say immediately, that's not that spell. Subsequent to that, I've, I've read an interview with uh, Quentin Tarantino where he talked about your involvement in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood right from the onset of, of literally plunging yourself into it and wanting to know every aspect of it. Is that something that you had right from the beginning or is it your way of knowing that to be a successful producer is to have this all-encompassing role and, and perhaps not to leave certain things to others? Um. I think one's role is different on different films, um, but um, I'm a fan. So I was a fan of Harry Potter. I was, you know, I'm, I'm a, a fan of Quentin Tarantino. I'm a fan of Alfonso Cuaron. I was a fan of Padding the Bear. These are things that, these are, these are people and pieces of material that I love because, and that's why I'm involved. So of course I want to know and learn as much as I can about them and about the pieces of, about the books, about, so, so um, uh, yes, so in, in, the, 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 there's that involvement. I think as a producer also, it helps to have a 360 view. So to learn about camera, to learn about acting, to learn about direction, to learn about what grips do, to learn about what electricity, to under, to, to, because you can bring, and also, by the way, as a producer, to have references beyond film. Um, you know, I don't remember that moment with, 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 with Harry, uh, the spells. Um, but I do remember, for example, talking to Stuart about uh, the maze in, in the fourth film and bringing reference in from uh, 
a piece of art, a, a Richard Serra piece of art that, um, uh, you know, uh, different disciplines impact upon work and so, so it's broader uh, 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 an experience and, and, and um, it, it can only be helpful. Um, but different directors want different things. So Quentin is very kind. You know, I was I threw myself in, and I learned, But it's a Quentin film, and there's you know he it, it's singularly his vision, and I make suggestions, and ninety nine percent of them he'll ninety nine percent of them he'll probably reject, and one percent he may he may take. Um, but but he's generous enough to allow me a seat at the table. And I take that seat very seriously. Um, so, um, you know, to answer, I, I mean, there's no, uh, I throw myself into, into projects. Uh, I love what I do. And actually, it's a privilege and a pleasure to learn um, as I continue to on every film, both in reading the source material, but also watching the films or, you know, Quentin, being on a Quentin Tarantino film is a film education. Uh, Noah too, you know, the references, the films they're recommending one looks at to, uh, to the, the, that inform them, inspired them in some way. Uh, that's just such a pleasure. Driving around in the, in, 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 in the location truck with Quentin, um, with uh, with the radio station from you know from from boss boss radio you know playing on on, on, on um, you know on, on the radio literally the, from 1969 him regaling with these stories about this location this film you know it's amazing so um, I think it's important to bring a, uh, respect for that knowledge and, and I've been I mean I'm, I feel incredibly fortunate. To, to do it. But yeah, I mean, I think any producer takes what they do seriously is going to want to be informed about what they do. Working from an adaptation, The Boy with the Striped Pajamas, um, again, a, a celebrated novel, a uh, much beloved novel, but potentially a challenge um, to attract a, a large enough audience. Again, was that, was that a, a, a tough project to work with or was that something that attracted investment quite quickly? Just going back again to give Warner's credit, you know, on gravity, we didn't yep. know the answers, but they supported. And there was a, a very good visual effects um, executive there at, at the time, um, Chris, who, who was also very supportive and helpful. Um, and, 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 and they allowed us to experiment because we were trying things out and failing, you know, we, all different technologies before we finally found the technology that worked for Alfonso's vision. So the studio did support with 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 um, with Boy in the Striped Pajamas. Uh, Daniel Batsik was the executive on that and was in, in, incredibly supportive. Um, they said yes to Mark. You know, Mark Herman had written the script. Uh, he he himself had optioned the book. He bought. I'd been interested in it. He got it. Um, I then, you know, he then came to me and asked if I'd like to produce it, which I said yes, and. Um, and we went to, and Miramax said yes. You know, they 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 were, and Daniel was incredibly supportive. I think it was a story that meant a lot to him, um, uh, and there was a belief. It was made at a budget. It was made in you know in Budapest. It was made on a budget um, that meant that it was viable. Um, it was the book was very successful, and that gave it currency and allowed Miramax to believe at the time that it had potential, um, commercial potential. Um, so, uh, that, you know, I mean, I don't think they were expecting it to be an outsized hit, they were, but it, it gave a, a healthy return on, on, it, on, on investment. And, and, and I think as a film that everybody associated with is incredibly proud of. And just in terms of your role, you mentioned Daniel Batsek was an exec on that film. Your own role as a producer and occasionally as an exec, um, how does that play out? Is it generally because of, uh, uh, there may be a project with Heyday Films and you come on board as an exec? Um, or how do you sort of divide between the two? And how much does your role as an exec vary in terms of involvement? 
I'm really, you know, um, you know, I'm an exec. Um, yeah, it depends on, on, on the film. I think the, I'm an exec more when I don't, I'm unable to be there as much as I would like, um, though I'm involved. Um, you know, in, 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 in a couple of films, I've actually had uh, very little to, to, to do with them. You know, the, the, for example, I Am Legend, you mentioned as a film I'm very proud of, but that began as a script that we developed, Neil and I developed. Um, and, um, and then they were gonna, it was gonna get made with, with Ridley Scott. And Neil and I went to meet with Ridley, but Ridley decided that he wanted to produce it himself. So we were, um, we were put to the side as it were. And then Akiva Goldsman, uh, who's a writer, producer, is the person who really conceived of it for Will Smith. Uh, I'm an executive producer, Neil and I are executive producers because of the nature of our involvement on it. Yep. Um, um, uh, something like We're the Millers, I love the script. I was asked to help that project, which was in danger of being abandoned. And I thought the script was very funny. And I, um, I managed to persuade, I think it was Bob Shea at the time, to not put it in turnaround. And um, the producer, I, I, I ended up not being there every, every day or not being a mom. And so um, I became an executive producer as opposed to producer. But sometimes it depends. It really does depend. Um, and my involvement differs from project to project, you know. Um, with Quentin, I said, when we met, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm busy. I'm not sure I can be there more than, you know, 20% of the time. And he said, 25%, he said, well, what about 40? What, what, about, what about 50? And I said, well, what about 40? And he said, you know, he, I wasn't going to say, I was, so whatever he said, I was going to say yes. But he, he said, we agreed on 40. I ended up being there 75% of the time of the shooting days yep. um, and throughout a lot of post. It, uh, I try not to do things half baked. Um, was that? I, I'm not sure if I'm yeah, asking. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I guess what I, with that in mind, I wanted to move on because I know that you exec the uh, three television films that were produced over the last few years and uh, that were written and directed over the last few years by David Hare. But more recently, you've moved into direct producing on series such as Threshold, The Capture, The Long Song, and upcoming Clickbait. I'm curious about the expansion of your role into television and is that just something that you're only ever going to do because you're attracted to the project or, or do you just see it as the natural role of a producer now to ensure that you you have as wide a landscape as possible i think it's the latter really i think unfortunately you know and we don't know what post-covid is is going to bring in terms of theatrical um, exhibition but clearly um, already there has been a migration towards branded entertainment. And I enjoy being a part of some big branded films. You know, it's, it, it, though I never enter them because of their brands. I enter them because of the characters and the stories. I think that's one of the reasons, by the way, that I think a lot of games, films made from games struggle is because they're, the brand, they're led by a, a brand and a, and, and, and a, you know, it's very rare that you have a film like, um, like Lego, the first Lego, which is as brilliant as it is when it's based purely on a toy as opposed to character. Um, uh, so, so, but what's happened is, is between Marvel and Star Wars and Pixar and, 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 and the likes, there's, and, and, and DC, there are fewer and fewer dramas uh, being made. And I, got into the business in part because of my love of American films of the 1970s, that those don't get made anymore. Thrillers, very hard to get made anymore. Why? Because of the, because of the competition for, for cinemas. And, 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 but where they are getting made is on television. And television, it's, I'm learning. I'm really at the beginning of a long, long, I mean, I learn on everything, but, but on a, I've got a steep learning curve there. But it affords the opportunity to tell a to explore characters in much greater depth, to tell stories that you can't get made any other way, mm -hmm. and to do it with over a longer time period. Um, I love it. I watch it voraciously, um, and, and really enjoying it. 
Um, I actually think there's an, what, there's an awful lot of good television. There's an awful lot of bad television. Um, and I'm trying very hard to make some good. And I, 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 again, I think I've failed more than I've succeeded, but um, hopefully we'll succeed more in the future. Um, I want to stay with your, your love of narrative and come to some questions that we've received. Um, first of all, someone's uh, written in, how do you approach working with, with writers? And perhaps as an addition to that, does the work with writers differ between television and film? Well, <clears throat> I mean, I would say that, 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 and this is a broad generalization, but I think if you speak to anybody who works in them, you, you'd probably get a similar response, which is film is a director's medium. The director really has the final say. Um, and television is a writer's medium. The, direct, the, the, the writer has... Uh, is, is the person really running the show and the director is all, is working for the writer um you know i think that 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 in both in both f with writers and directors it's about supporting them and understanding why they're telling the story that they they are telling or wanting to tell um and being constructive in criticism not just being critical but at the same time never settling um, and, you know, it, it, the script is never finished, the, 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 the film is never finished, it's sort of wrenched from your hands because it, you either have to go into production or, it, or it's got to be released. Um, you know, I, I, I think that, that, that it, with, a, with working with, with writers, there are, you know, there are sort of two different paths that I suppose I've pursued, or three. There is... Uh, uh, coming from an original idea where you have to make, make sure that, that there is a commonality of vision when you begin. And I think that beginning point is really essential is making sure, and it's same with the director that there is a thing that you will share a vision, but there is the, there is the Paddington bear where you have a property, you have some books, um, you have some stories, but it needs to really be fleshed out. You have a, an original story by a writer, or you have a book um, which can have different levels of, 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 of completion, as it were. You know, there can be books where, where it's an idea or it's a character, or it's an, but it might not be all three. Um, and then there's the occasional one that has all three. But throughout the process, it's being in a, in a constructive communication about what's working and what's not, and about always presenting a sense of possibility and being realistic when something's not working and being direct in communication. I think people know when you're full of BS and it's important to, 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 to tell someone when, when you need to be able to explain why, or if you can't explain why, you can say it's just a feeling. Um, and often, and it's also knowing that my ideas are not right necessarily, but if I'm feeling something to trust that if my solution is wrong or the area that I'm pointing to is wrong, it highlights maybe a problem that may be elsewhere. And again, I think like with everything, it's bringing humility, not know, acknowledging that one doesn't know. I have another question here. You've recently worked with Malia Bello. Um, but the directing landscape still feels very male out there. Have you found a change in studios and financiers interest or trust in female directors? Um, I feel absolutely and diverse directors, uh, writers and directors, definitely. Um, and I think it's a long overdue, uh, much needed imperative. Um, but I think it actually goes across all aspects of the industry. I go, I have been on sets um, as, as I think most producers, every producer has, and shocked and dismayed by how lily white and often middle class they are. Um, along with Tim Bevan, Eric Fellner, Barbara Broccoli, Michael Wilson, and Lisa Breyer, all in, in the industry. Um, I'm, I'm a founder of a school called London Screen Academy which is in North London, which is, which is a, a free school for 16 to 19 year olds, two year program, teaching um, behind, the, behind the camera disciplines uh, for 
uh, um, for students of a broad socioeconomic base. We have students from every single, pretty much every single borough in London. And, you know, the key for me in broadening, you know, it's, imper it's essential that we have a broader base of material that reflects the makeup of society um, on camera. And, it, and in order for that to happen, it's essential that we have, the, that our crews and our executives and our producers and our actors, everybody reflects the makeup of our, of, of our, of our nation, of the world. Uh, in America, in the UK, elsewhere. Um, so this school is part of that. And I think that you know, there are so many jobs available um, or emerging, I, and I believe post-COVID too, in the creative industries. They say that in the film and television, there's going to be, this was prior to COVID, and I don't know how much that's going to change. So, um, but there are going to be 5,000 new jobs, new jobs in the next five years. Many people don't believe there's an opportunity for them in the creative industries, but there is. And what we're trying to do is, is, is with the school is, is, is encourage a broader participation in the industry and educate kids so that when they, are, um, when they go, choose to go on set in, 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 in two or three years time, that they will be set ready. And also because of who we are, uh, we, the industry has embraced this in such a fantastic way. There's a great dialogue between the school and the industry. A lot of people from industry coming and giving master classes and engaging in the education. And also we're going we, we're to do everything we can to ensure that there are opportunities and develop internship programs, as many of the studios are doing and Netflix and, and, and Sky and the BBC are doing to, so that young people have the opportunity to learn and experience the industry and gain and access. We, uh, I, I mentioned to you earlier that I literally live almost opposite um, the, the Screen Academy um, and they are hybrid fields, large fields around the corner. And I was walking up there one day and there was um, a di diverse group of young female uh, filmmakers, film crew, working and this older woman was walking past and curious as to what they were doing and she just walked up to them and said so what, what, what's going on what are you doing here and one of the young students just turned around and said i'm finding my voice which i thought was one of oh. the most beautiful things oh my god to That's, hear someone say it's just, it is that that is such a thank you i've that is such a um that's an amazing thing to hear um well you know to me it's my my most exciting and most important project. Um, and I think I, I'm, you know, I think all six founders, I think everybody involved with the school feels the same way. It's an amazing thing. And BAFTA members, you know, anybody on the school, please engage. We need you. We need the engagement of industry. It is an amazing place, an amazing, and, and filled with possibility. And we can change the face of our industry only for the better by giving our students the possible the opportunities that I think we're giving them. I have another question here. Um, do you have any advice on the best way to find independent financing for initial script development? <sighs> you know, it's hard. It's hard. You know, the BFI. There, there are lots of local screen, uh, uh, you know, organisations. You know, um, and there are you know in the London too, and the BFI. Um, is really, I would approach the BFI, they are a great resource, not just for financing, but also for information. And they will be able to supply probably, uh, well, undoubtedly more information than I can. Um, at the moment, I'm either funding myself or actually not doing that very much, but securing funding from from other places like the BBC and and and, and, and uh, uh, for film from the BBC, from Channel 4, and from American, you know, Studio Canal, Pathé, American financiers, or from, you know, or from television companies. But I'm independent financing, very hard. I've, I've got a question here about time management. I'd like to know if David often has multiple projects in development at the same time, and if so, how does he go about prioritizing his work and time on them, and keep plates spinning if one is beginning to get traction? I have to say, I'm, I'm, you know, one of the things that lockdown is is showing me is is highlighting to me is is is, you know, the need to manage that better. But 
both for the projects, but also as important and maybe more important for my family. Um, um, you know, I last year I, I had a, a, two films and a TV series going and I was pulled every which way. Um, and I was just very clear with the people with whom I was working both at the outset, what they could expect from what, what, what they could expect me, but also telling them if they ever needed me or needed more that I, to, to let me know again, communication. Some people are better at it than others. Some people don't tell you and it manif their, their anger or, or concern or whatever manifests itself in, in other ways, um, indirectly or passive aggressively or whatever it may be. Um, um, but for the most part, I've been fortunate enough to make it work. I have good people working for me and the key is putting together a good team around, the direct, around a director or a project. The project does not rely on me alone. As long as I am there for key moments, um, uh, then the, the, the project will thrive. One of the things I've learned in terms of going back to an earlier question uh, of where I am, I've, I've, I've you know, I used to micromanage and give notes on a script in the most microscopic detail. Sometimes that's worthwhile and sometimes it's not. And sometimes it's learning the forest from the trees and learning when one is most effective being sometimes in a slightly broader place and giving slightly broader note than talking about the color of a, of, of, of a dress or, or a the versus an and in a script. You know, I, 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 um, but I think making sure you hire the very best people on the job and where needed people who can you know, complement and, and carry the load when I, when, 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 when I can be there and when I can't be there. But so far, it hasn't been, it hasn't been a problem. Um, you know, I, 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 there, are, there were moments during the awards season last, which, which is the most, in some ways, you know, it's an amazing thing to be a part of, but it's also the most ridiculous thing. It takes so long, so much energy, so many, so much, so many air miles and wasted, bad for the environment, bad in so many ways. Um, uh, but, you know, with Quentin and Noah and each having events on the same day, I'm waiting. I got anxious, but ultimately, you know what, you can only do what you can do. And as long as you're honest about that communication, um, very few problems are, are, are arise, but I think the key is being communicative and 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 making sure that the director, in particular, on a project, it's and has the support that he needs beyond oneself. Uh, Noah's film, Marriage Story, was his second project with Netflix, and I've got a question here about the future of traditional theatrical distribution and exhibition, and and how you feel about that. Well. Um, and Noah would say the same. I love the theatrical experience and would always want my films to have that if possible. That being said, and this may, might, might, may change, you know, it really might, uh, but right now, and I think post COVID, we're gonna be feeling it possibly even more acutely because people have got so much more used to watching films at home and television shows at home is there needs to be a reason to go to the cinema. What, there is the communal experience, which I think people will always enjoy. And, uh, uh, but I also think that the, the sort of the event nature, why can I see this on the big screen versus in my, at home on my, on my you know, whatever size television uh, I have. So, you know, a film like Noah's, we could not have, we could not have got the budget that we did for that film anywhere else. Um, and with Scarlett Johansson and Adam Driver, we needed a budget of a certain size. So Netflix was the place that gave it to us. They also put it out in such a way and gave us a theatrical release of four weeks. Um, in in a way that I they put so much behind it because it means more than theatrical it, it, it's about building their brand and awareness of their brand as Netflix 
they put so much more behind it than anybody else could have. So they enabled the film to get out there in a way that I don't think it would have in any other way. I think Alfonso would say, say the same about Roma. Uh, they were incredible partners. Uh, but we still want to have that theatrical experience. I think that the, I think, and um, I know the theater owners won't like this, I suspect that the windows are going to come down um, and uh, maybe the, we'll see how open the streamers are to, to extending, uh, but I think the theater owners are going to have to come down. I, I, I just think it's an inevitability. I, you know, I love Quentin, Noah, Alfonso, any filmmaker I wants to have the, that theatrical experiences. There are some films that I think are fine on, 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 on streaming, but, but that sense of scale, boy, and that sense of community of laughing together of being scared together is a lovely, you know, irreplaceable thing. I've got a question from Mark Towers. Uh, so you mentioned the US independent films from the 1970s that don't get made anymore. Do you think there's less space for grassroots indie films in cinemas these days? Um, and if you were to start today, how would you think, how do you think you would do that? Um, yes, there's less opportunities, less theatres, less time in theatres. Um, you know, you used to have, you know, in, in, in the 70s and I think even the, the 90s, you know, a film, look at Titanic, which is not an independent film, but it stayed in cinemas for over a year. Um, and and independent films had the opportunity to build awareness and build momentum and, and word of mouth reviews and word of mouth had value so that they could build an audience. You can't do that today. It's almost impossible to do that today because you can't be in a cinema for long enough. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's the reality, you know, uh, I still believe in the power of, 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 of independent cinema and I will make independent films if I, if I, you know, if, 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 if I moved in some way or if I connect with them in some way, but it's a much harder landscape. And actually Amazon and, you know, and, and Netflix have assumed the role in, in some ways of making those independent films or those films that can't get made elsewhere. The Irishman, not an independent film, but is a film that nobody else would make. Netflix is the only company that would do it. Um, you know, uh, so uh, I, 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 I think that you know, they are, they're acquiring most certainly, and I think financing independent films as well. Um, I know Amazon is, and I think Netflix is too. If you're starting, an, I, I still believe that there is an opportunity for uh, independent theatrical films. And I think that you probably have to begin with one or two houses. I mean, you know, Quentin shows, it has a, a, um, a re retro house. You know, he, he shows old films at, at, at his cinema uh, in, in LA. Um, but there are a couple there that, and he balances those with new films. But there are a couple of independent houses that still thrive here and there. Um, but I don't know whether it is a, you know, Curzon, look at what Curzon has done. I think that, you know, that Philip Natural has done the most incredible job with that company. So it can exist, um, but I don't pretend to have any expertise in knowing how. I'll speak to Philip Natural because he is best in class. I've, I know we've got um, to wrap up shortly. I've, I've, we're getting a whole flurry of questions coming in now. Um, quite a few have been about casting. So perhaps we can have a general question about your, your involvement as a rule on casting. And specifically, one person has asked about whether you've ever had an experience of having to fight for an undiscovered talent. Um, well, um... I think, you know, I mean, here's an example, um, and this is quite early in my career. I mean, Daniel, so, so, so on Harry Potter, uh, we'd been looking for Harry for months. We had done open calls in Australia, in the UK. We began in the UK, then we expanded to the US and to Australia. And we were around three months out and we still hadn't found our Harry. We'd found possibilities for Ron and Hermione, but not Harry. And I went to, the theater 
that, that one evening with Steve Clovis, who was in London working on the screen on the screenplay. And I walked in and there was a boy in the audience uh, who I walked by and I thought he looked amazing. He had a, a really interesting sort of an old soul in a young body. And um, throughout the first, uh, it was two acts, first act, I kept on looking behind me, not paying much attention to the play, looking at this boy who was so focused on, 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 on the theatre. And after, uh, at, at, at uh, intermission, I went up to um, the father and it turned out I knew him and, and spoke to him and spoke to the boy a little bit, went and sat Sat, sat, sat down and um, again kept on looking behind and at the end of the play they'd left and I couldn't get to them. I called up Alan who I knew and uh, I said you know what has your boy ever acted? Well he had it turned out and actually Chris Columbus had expressed interest in him um, but they hadn't been open to it. Dan didn't want to do it. Anyway, I went and sat down. Had, he said, well, why, Alan said, why don't you sit with him? Why don't you meet him? So I did. And we spent, you know, a couple of hours, he, his mom and me talking. And he then came out and met Chris. And there were a couple of, you know, Chris had partners who were not so sure. There were three or four other, oh, and we screen tested. Then we screen tested. And there were three kids. And the other kids, other producers really liked one of the other children, an American boy. And I felt strongly that Dan was, uh, it was the, definitely the best of the, of, of the three. And he, uh, and it was very close to Chris making a decision. And I just felt if he slept on it, I said, well, let's stop. Let, let's sleep on this and come back the next day and make a, make a decision. Because Chris was not sure, he was wavering. Anyway, Chris went away, came back the following morning, Chris, and it was Chris's decision, it wasn't mine. Chris made the decision that Dan should be our Harry. Um, so in, in, in that sense, I suppose, um, you know, that's an example of an unknown. We want an unknown and it not coming from a traditional source. And again, looking and going to the theater, who'd have thought that I'd find, that we'd find Harry in, 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 in the audience. Um, you know, you're always pushing for people and, 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 and having those discussions with the director. Um, ultimately, it's allowing, it's presenting the director material that he sees. And by the way, that's uh, people in front of the camera and also behind. You know, Alfonso didn't know Jani Tamim when he was working on Harry Potter and was looking for a, co um, a costume designer. And uh, my mum had made a film um, called Gangster Number no. One. And Jani had done the costumes in that, and I thought they were so striking. I showed them to Alfonso, and he loved it, and met her, and then he made. But it's it's so it's a producer to present, but it's the and you can make your case, but really it's the director who's making the decision. The producer can never can get credit deserve credit for any of that. It's the director's decision. He's well, I guess it's that what you were saying about communication being so important, um, it strikes me through uh, what you've been talking about over the course of the last hour, you've also got to be a very good facilitator. I think other people may not necessarily have been at the theatre and been looking around or thought about Jani Tamim in that way. Yes, and you know, it's, it, 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 to me, it, 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 it's, it's, it goes back to Ned Tannen, it's daring to be different, it's not necessarily going down expected paths, not necessarily presenting what has been presented before, but being open. And actually, if you do it in a way that allows your voice to be heard, then it can be. Um, knowing that it's not about ego, because if, if, it, if my ideas are rejected, that's their call. But it's presenting it in a way that allows it to be, to be, to be taken or rejected, but definitely pushing harder for those one wants taken. <laughs> but, but ultimately, it's not my call. We're going to have to wrap it shortly, but I, I must say I've had so many questions coming in talking about your passion for the London Screen Academy. Um, so people have asked, how can they become more involved? And also one person has asked, uh, is there an intention to have a Screen Academy outside of London in perhaps Cardiff or Birmingham or up in mm -hmm. Scotland? Um, we need to make sure this one has only been open, a, not even a year. We opened um, 
in, in September. And as you can imagine, lockdown and, and remote learning has posed challenges. And I think we've done, you know, our, our teachers and headmasters have done an incredible job, but it's challenging. Um, we are at the moment 300 students, will be 600 by uh, ne next year. Um, I think if you go on the LSA website, um, you will, you will, if you look up Lon the London Screen Academy on, you know, on Google or whatever you're, you know, you will find it. And if you go onto it, you will see the school and the information you need. If not, please contact me through BAFTA because I really want to get every one of you involved in, in, in some way. Mentoring, you know, donating money, donating time, giving internships, giving master, it, everything is valuable. And finally, to come back to the beginning where uh, I mentioned I saw you um, being interviewed for Marriage Story and you talked uh, about follow your heart. Um, just finally, advice for producers working on perhaps the first or second or third film. What, what with your experience, would you say to them along with follow your heart? Um, don't, be a, don't be frightened of what you don't know. Approach everything with humility, but... Um, you know, the, 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 the other part of it, you know, I was, there's a story that Winston Churchill, um, of Winston Churchill going to speak at, at class day at, at Charterhouse, the school he'd been kicked out of. I think he was 90 or in his late eighties. And he hobbles up on a walking stick to speak to the graduating students. He says, I have just nine words of advice to give to you. Never give in, never give in never give in and he turns around and he sits down you know you have to be tenacious you have to be relentless and i think the key is again finding people who share your vision and giving them the support they need to help to realize that vision or the director's vision um, and be tireless in doing so but don't be scared to ask questions because I ask questions every day, and you know, it, 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 you know, I'm, maybe I'm uh, uh, asking from with, and doing things with a little more experience, but I'm learning every single day on every single project on every single film. So don't be embarrassed about what you don't know. It's okay. Unfortunately, we are going to have to wrap it up there. Um, thank you to Palumi and Bafta for organizing this event. Tammy, who has been doing the closed captioning for the whole event, uh, thank you very much. But most of all, David, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me and thank you for, for listening in. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.